Hello, and welcome to this edition of Represent NYC on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I am New York State Assemblymember Inez E. Dickens, representing the 70th Assembly District, serving the communities of Central Harlem, Morningside Heights, East Harlem, and a, a part of the Upper West Side. Today, we will be talking about the reopening of schools citywide and how it affects policy, our communities, and most of all, our families. I'm grateful to MNN, and I, I want to publicly thank them for allowing us to have this live stream on a, a topic that most families and communities, even if they have no children, are very concerned about, and that is the reopening of the schools because this year is different. This year we had COVID-19 and because of the pandemic, um, and because it, it spread so widely and, and became a, not just in a city or a state, it became international throughout the world. And so uh, it's, it's frightening to people and we want to have the answers. We want our children educated, but we want to have the answers. Joining me today are several distinguished panelists. And I want to first introduce my colleague that serves with me in this, the uh, New York State Assembly and has his district is adjoining to mine. And that's Assembly Member Robert Rodriguez, representing the 68th district serving the communities of East Harlem. Also, we're very privileged to have with us the chair in the state legislature, the chair of the education committee, that's assembly member Michael Benedetto, who represents the 82nd, which is Co-op City, Throgs Neck, Westchester, but today he's representing the entire state because he's the chair of, of education. Uh, we have with us Adrian Austin, the Deputy Chancellor at the Board of Ed, and she's the Ch Deputy Chancellor of Community Empowerment, Partnerships, and Communication, the Deputy Superintendent of School District 5, Robin Davison, the Chair of CEC 5 Policy Committee, Dr. Samuel Canton Beckles, and, and a good friend that I love working with is Pamela Stewart, the borough president appointee and president of the CEC District 5. And we have Principal Kalima Norman, principal of Wadley Secondary on, on 114th Street in Harlem, y'all. Just want y'all to know, in Harlem. So uh, uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I'd like, we don't have time for a lot of, of conversation, but I'd like for Robert Rodriguez, I'd like for Bobby to please start uh, with something opening or a question that you may have. And then I want to go to Michael Benedetto. And I, uh, Adrian, I want you to understand as the Deputy Chancellor, you're going to be answering the questions that the that parents have sent in and that may continue to send it on the chat. Thank you, Inez. I appreciate you hosting this and giving me an opportunity to um, come represent uh, the east side of Harlem. I do have a few schools in District 5, but District 4 is um, also very tuned in to the reopening process. And of course, we heard through you know the, the CEC meeting and the last conversations, all the concerns of parents about how we reopen, how do we do it safely, um, getting the information out um, on how they can either work remotely um, or be able to opt into to going to school buildings when they're safe, but really a general sentiment of, of concern on how this is being rolled out and in general the concerns about how we get the information out to people. So thank you, MNN, because this is a very important venue at a very important time where there's a lot of information um, that is that are going to parents, a lot of difficult decisions that are being made um, about how they proceed with schooling, and, and then certainly a lot of diff difficult decisions um, on the on behalf of administrators about how to roll out, um, you know, the the reopening and do it in a method that's safe. So um, yeah, I thank everybody here because um, all of the administrators on this call are committed to figuring out how to do this 
how to serve the community, how to get parents, um, you know, um, connected and, and providing the right kind of support for their children. And just a quick aside, there are some countries that have just given up on educating their kids. There are some countries who are just like, you know what, during the pandemic, we're going to call it a day and we'll get back to it when, when things are lower. And, and I, you know, I think we're, um, you know, we have enough technology, capacity, intellect, you know, um, uh, enthusiasm from not just parents, but also administrators to be able to put something in place that makes sense. So I know we're going to get to that here, but I just wanted to say thank you all for uh, all our administrators who are making it happen on the ground. And thank you, Inez. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Chair Benedetto? Yeah, um, I share, um, I know the, what Robert was just talking about, that some countries have uh, given up on education this year. And um, I uh, certainly understand that. Um, um, I have my own personal opinion on that, and it is my personal opinion. Um, I don't think it's safe in the pure sense of things to, to open up schools. Um, uh, certainly for this whole semester and maybe the whole year. But that's some personal opinion I, that I have. Um, I do not envy um, Chancellor Carranza and uh, Mayor de Blasio who are making these uh, um, decisions along with Miss Austin, uh, the deputy uh, um, chancellor um, who's with us. Um, these are tough decisions to make. Um, these are quite literally life and death decisions that we're making here um, on sending our school kids back or not sending them back. And I know uh, um, the school teachers are very, very much uh, um, worried about this as we saw today with their announcement to delay the openings of school to make them safer. I don't know how that is done. I uh, applaud them for making, making every effort possible for our kids to come in at a very difficult time when we don't even know what funds we're going to have to make these schools safe and to give the resources to our teachers and to our um, children, to our parents, um, to, to educate them properly um, because of all the funding that we have lost throughout the, uh, the months of, of the pandemic. And we are looking at Washington to to help us out. So so um, this could be a, a time that is um, um, changing every single day. Um, you know what's going to happen, and we are going to have to um, react to the changing policies that are going to be played um, going forward. But we're up to the challenge, and we will accept the challenges as they come. All right, thank you so much. And Adrian, I, I just want us to hear from the Deputy Superintendent of School District 5, Robin Davidson, please, just to, so she will see where your head is at about the reopening. Hi, good afternoon all. So um, myself and Superintendent Dr. Rux have been working tirelessly, communicating with our schools to ensure that they um, have everything that they need. And if they don't have what they need, that it's been escalated and communicated to all the you know, stakeholders and constituents um, who to make sure that schools are opening safely. Um, that is our top priority. We ourselves and our district team, um, as I said, have been in constant communication with our um, principals. We visited schools um, and you know we keep the lines of communication open to support them in any way we can. All right, well, thank you. And uh, Principal Kalima Norman, Principal of Wadley. I just want to thank all those who have come together to be thought partners um, in the healthy reopening of schools. But I wouldn't, I would be remiss um, to not mention Desiree Romaine, who's a principal like myself, who will not be opening her schools this year um, due to COVID complications that eventually led to her death. And therefore, um, although I am led by Richardson Khan and Excellence with the Affinity Team and New Vision at the helm of All Excellence. I have some questions about opening in the way that we are due to the fact that certain supplies have not been given yet to school in order to open on time. And I'm a principal that's showing up and I, I will definitely lead 
as best as I can under whatever direction I'm given, but I do have some questions and concerns for my school community, especially when it comes to supply. Dr. Canton Beckles, Chair of CEC5 Policy Committee. Hi, everyone. Um, first, I would like to thank the Assemblywoman for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this conversation. Um, I do sit on a uh, few different committees around the reopening, and um, there are a lot of concerns as a parent with three children who will be attending public school, as well as an educator who runs a pre-K three and four program. Um, you know, I feel like the Department of Ed has two conversations going. You have central office, you know, with these great analogies of how they're going to open up, but when you actually get on the ground, there's not enough support for teaching staff, principals, um, part of the materials are not there, some are. And I just think the conversation is confusing, not only for parents, but not taking into account that we have to work and do these different things. So I have a lot of questions. Um, and I, I hope that we can find a clear path that we can all work together um, to make it possible for children to return to a building. But I don't want it to be at the expense of their life or members of their family's lives. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how this conversation goes today. Uh, agreed upon, Dr. Beckel. So thank you so much. And uh, now I would like uh, Pamela Stewart, who is the borough president appointee and the president of the Community Education Council District 5. Pam? You know, this is very tough for us, especially in our community, because as you know, our community was hard hit. A lot of the um, housing um, developments um, lost a great deal of family um, members. Um, we on the CEC actually lost one of our members, which was heartbreaking. And um, principals are still um, working with their families around trauma and it's just a lot going on. But what I, I what bothers me Assemblywoman is the fact that there are other conversations going on in the background between the mayor and and um, the the budget, right? The budget is the conversation. The, it's the funding that is driving everything. And that's just my opinion, right? So when we're talking about our children in District 5, we're not talking about our children. We're talking about funding. We want our children to go into the, they want our children to go into the school buildings because it, it, it brings funding. So I have a problem with that, right? But there's a lot going on. Our principals, um, Robin, thank you so much, along with um, Superintendent um, Rux, doing a wonderful job trying to get the principals up, you know, all the support that they need. Um, but there are a lot of questions from the parents. And there's a, a, there's a huge problem. Um, Adrian, you know, thank you so much for always um, trying your best to answer my questions and give us support. I truly appreciate it. But we're still having problems with communication for families in temporary housing. They're having problems with internet access. Some students don't have functional um, um, computers, devices, you know, um, and our district is seems to be continue to be the last dist district to receive the supplies that they need. So there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of concerns regarding safety and health. And um, I like Dr. Beckles. I am looking forward to find out the direction and how we can answer some of these questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, now, Deputy Chancellor Adrian Austin of VOE, um, you've heard some of the concerns registered. We have questions that many of them did not pose in their opening statement, and we have questions that were sent in uh, prior to our live stream. Uh, and I have additional questions, but if you want to make a statement before we get into the questions, Please do so. Thank you, Assemblymember Inez Dickens, for inviting me to participate in this conversation. Thank you to Assemblymember Benedetto, Assemblymember Rodriguez for joining the conversation, to my parent leaders and to my colleagues. Um, I hear you. I have been around the city for the last six months uh, in town halls across the city. I've been in parent forums. 
Um, our parent information sessions have brought out 20,000 plus, 30,000 plus parents. We've received thousands and thousands of questions from parents. And so I do believe I have a good pulse as to where we are. I am a parent. I talk to parents every day. I know folks are concerned. Uh, people want it to go back to a sense of norm normalcy, but there's real questions about how you do that in a safe way when we still are in the midst of a global pandemic. And so I wanna say I am heartened by the announcement that was made this morning by the mayor and the chancellor with the UFT. Uh, the head of the UFT, the head of CSA, the head of DC 37, all coming together and saying, we want to do this in a safe and a safe way. And in order to do that, we have to delay reopening. And so now that reopening in person date has been pushed back to the 21st of September. That's listening to our principals. That's listening to our teachers. That's listening to our families and, and hearing what they say and what they have said thus far is like, we're not ready. Um, all of our supplies are not where they need to be. Um, all of our air ventilation uh, checks need to happen. People have to feel comfortable with the quality of the air ventilation systems in all of our buildings before we bring back staff and students into those spaces. Um, so there's a lot of work to do before we get to the 21st, but I'm heartened by the fact that we have delayed in an acknowledgement that we're not there yet. Uh, and we are pushing and thank you to our principals like Principal Norman, like Deputy Superintendent Davson, like all of our principals who are doing the work, our Deputy Superintendent, Superintendent's doing the work of trying to get us there uh, because they've been literally working around the clock, working their fingers to the bone, our custodial staff, to get us to a place where we can reopen. And it's a lot of work and it's difficult work to do during a pandemic. So I wanna thank you all for the work that you're doing. And I'm heartened by the fact that we are, we've delayed reopening and that we are also investing a considerable amount of time up front to professional development for our teachers. So that as our teachers go into remote learning, it looks different than it did in the spring. Uh, Cause certainly that's another concern that was voiced and articulated to our parents across the last six months was, can you improve the quality of remote instruction if this is going to be a feature of learning and education as we're in this pandemic? We've heard you. Uh, I'm really happy we're in a place where we're able to deliver on that. And so from the uh, teachers come back, I think on the 4th through the um, 16th, they'll be engaged for that first like you know week or so or week and a half in professional learning opportunities where they're really getting comfortable with the virtual learning platforms and getting ready with the social emotional supports and embedding social emotional curriculum into their academic curriculum. So that when we do bring students in, both with remote and then also with in person, we're prepared. So with that, I know there's a million questions. I'm gonna step back, I'm ready to take them. Thank All you. Right, thank you so much. Well, thanks to the UFT president, Amogru, and the all of the educators um, and the principals uh, that worked with Mayor de Blasio to see to it that that if, that school reopening was uh, put back for a one week, really. Um, tell me, uh, one week, what is going to be done in one week? Because I know that the uh, school districts had to make a submission of, of a plan. Parents were asked to fill out forms uh, as to what their, their intentions about their children uh, were going to be towards blended learning, whether it was going to be remote learning, et cetera. But, but tell me, Adrian, really, what do you expect to get done? Because I haven't seen any cleaning going on in, in any of my schools. Uh, and I'm, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. I just didn't see it. And so I, I'm, I'd like to know, what do you really expect is going to change between the 10th and the 21st? Yeah, I can tell you that, that custodians are working around the clock. I can tell you the principals are working around the clock. I can tell you the teachers are working around the clock. And so every day, incrementally, we're making progress towards benchmarks. So we set a goal September 10th. We are far enough along towards September 10th that you know everyone's taken a step back and said, okay, we need more time. Our staff needs more time to prepare. And now we have a new benchmark, a date that we're driving toward. And the promise that's been made by our chancellor and the promise that was made by the mayor was we are not gonna reopen unless we are prepared to meet all of the safety checklists, all of the requirements needed to safely embrace our teachers, our staff, our students back into school buildings. And so what this signals, at least to me, and I hope to everyone, is that there is a responsiveness and there is a willingness to adapt if we cannot get there, if we feel like we need additional time. And so we've asked for additional time. Our principals asked for additional time. Now we have additional time. We've postponed the date. 
um, and, and we'll see how far we can go, given the fact that folks are working around the clock to get this done. I am confident that we'll make progress. I appreciate that, Adrian. However, just one last question, uh, because I am still concerned because the only way that the, the, the reopening was, was postponed really was because UFT and the membership uh, and the principals and the parents uh, were, were complaining and writing about it and had serious concerns. So, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I, I'm sorry, Adrian, I just, I don't buy into the fact that, that I think that, that this would have been done had it not been for that community outcry from all the levels. But I want to just ask one question, because we're talking about whether we're ta uh, talking about remote learning, or, and, and there was some discussion about whether they were going to be on that uh, outside in the parks, etc. Um, can, can parents choose to switch their children from remote learning halfway through the school year, or whatever way they've chosen, they would have to continue? That's just one, you know, short question. Then I want to throw it out to other others on here. Uh, yes. So the next timeline for parents who have opted into remote only, their timeline to be able to opt back in will be in November. And that was just to be able to give the principals a sort of set amount of students that they, that they knew they were programming. And principals have already started to program students into classes, assign teachers to classes, et cetera. And they needed some amount of certainty in order to do that. Mm -hmm. And just to your earlier point, you were absolutely right. Hearing from our families, hearing from our elected officials, hearing from our principal, our folks who are actually on the ground doing the work, is absolutely critical to being able to formulate a plan. And the people who were responsible for, for executing the plans, our principals, our teachers, when they said, this is impossible, we need you to give, we need, we, we need X, Y, and Z, um, I think that's what today signals is that we're, we're, the mayor is responsive to that and, and that's what's given us this additional time. My Deputy Chancellor, I know that we've talked a little bit about the um, blended learning, remote and school um, options. One of the ones that came out late that I think people know the least about is how are you doing outside learning? You know, how is the integration of outside spaces being incorporated? I don't think a lot of information has, you know, um, kind of reached parents about how that's going to work and how it works on a district level, a school level, an overall level. Some schools have decent spaces, some schools don't. Uh, so if you could help uh, uh, elaborate on that, that'd be helpful. Just to piggyback on that, uh, I want to know if there, if, even if the school has a, a, a yard in which to learn, what happens when it suddenly has a downpour of rain? What, what, what I, you know, it just doesn't even sound reasonable to me uh, to do that because sometimes we get a downpour of rain and we don't know. So I'm sorry, Adrian, I just wanted to piggyback on, on Bobby's question. Great question. And so this is not, the outdoor learning plan is not a replacement for classroom space, meaning that there are not going to be schools that entirely leave their school buildings and plan entirely to have kids outside 24-7, Monday through Friday, for the exact uh, issues that you're raising, Assemblymember Dickens, that if it rains, if there's inclement weather, there needs to be a place in the school building where students can go. The idea around this is really to supplement the environment that's available to, to principals and to teachers to be able to use. And so what we have created is an application process. There's a centralized team that will be looking at applications that we get from principals. Principals will identify the spaces that they want to use, how they want to use those spaces. We are suggesting that, pe that principals think through physical education, arts education, music education, um, that those would be really great subject areas to sort of move outdoors if there is a space nearby and for principals to create in consultation with their school leadership team, which are the parents in the schools, um, the other you know, teachers, other school personnel to create a plan. And that plan will go to the central team. And then the central team will work with our sister agencies, the Department of Parks and Recreations, the Department of Transportation to be able to then, uh, to be able to get all of the sort of checks um, in place so that we can grant access to those spaces and in incorporate those into the school's uh, portfolio of spaces they can use. So the principals are the ones who are the, the gatekeepers for this. They have an application that they fill out that they submit that's online. Uh, and parents should ask their principals if they want to know if the school has submitted a plan or is interested. And obviously, we're thinking through safety. We've heard from communities. Some communities have an uptick in gun violence. I've heard from parents who say, like, this is not a good time to have kids outside. We, I, don't, I don't feel safe. That's the kind of conversation that principals are having with their families because ultimately it has to be a whole school community that decides to embrace the outdoor learning plan for the school. I agree and the, the uptake in the gun violence, but in addition, 
uh, there's been a, a significant increase in the rodent population. And so I'm, you know, very nervous about that. But I want, uh, Principal Norman, would you weigh in on that, please? Well, I don't, I know that all intention was well around finding other places and spaces, but taking children outside is a, not a very simple process, especially when you have like trips. Um, so if I take 15 children out, you have bathroom breaks that children are going to need. Um, if you're not at the building, how do you return? Uh, even if you use the space, as Robbie has been blessed with a, a wonderful pit, if you watch my youngsters, especially my sixth and eighth graders, come in from lunch, every teacher after lunch hates to be that teacher because they kind of linger, you know. Um, so I understand that principals have that right to plan, but I don't think it's for um, all school districts in an equitable way who have that access that would allow for this type of plan to really take shape. Um, places and spaces such as mine, that's not a very feasible option. Um, due to gun violence, due to the rodent population, and also due to the age group of my babies, that even though they're high schoolers, taking them outside, somebody can wander off and not kind of make it back. And so I'm trying to make sure that, you know, with COVID being what it is, and, and that we know some science fiction, and I appreciate when the chancellor says so that we don't do science fiction, um, I'm not interested also in exposing them to more people outside. Um, while I'm trying to keep them more inside. So, I mean, I, I get the well intention and I understand that people are thinking day and night, but, you know, school trips, I have three children, I've taken them out and I've barely kept up with the three of them. <laughs> they should take out 15 people in a 45 minute time. Um, return them back on the next door, it's just not feasible. But, I mean, I understand it's by principle. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. If homeschooling is a uh, family decides to do homeschooling, uh, what adequate training has been given to the parents? Um, what subsidy is going to be there to assist them on an ongoing basis? And uh, uh, people are now returning back to work. If we have this blended learning, what's going to happen? So I'm sorry, Dr. Beckles, please go ahead. No, one of the concerns I have is, you know, while I think DOE has great intentions and a lot of work has went into trying to reopen. You know, part of the struggle I have as a parent and an educator in that situation um, is that you have blended learning. Kids are going to be staggered into the building. Um, they're going to go one or two or three days a week. But me as a director of a school, I have to be in my building every day. So where do I send my kids on the remote side of it, right? So we now have this Bridges to Learning program that DOE is proposing. I have a friend of mine who's executive director who received the grant. You know, it goes back to the conversation Pam talked about earlier about funding. Everything is about the money. And so, yeah, you came up with bridges to learning and you're going to provide this grant through DYCD for CBOs or daycares to provide those alternate days. But my question to you is how are you going to kids keep, keep kids any safer in an after school program when you're providing less funding for them to, to have the, the same safety abilities at the DOE school, right? How are we gonna keep the kids safe in those environments? And for parents who work a job and I have to be to work at nine o'clock, if my son's time is 10 a.m., who's gonna stay with my child to bridge that gap? So, you know, realistically, I know that we wanna reopen schools, but a lot like this, the assembly, um, the chair of the education committee, I think schools should not be reopened at this time because you don't have all the pieces that's gonna effectively work and support that. In my district alone, in District 5, where I'm a CEC member along with Pamela, we have teachers who have requested the alternative leave because they don't want to come back in the building. So the other issue is human capital. What are you going to do with the bodies? Principals are not going to have enough teachers to actually do the blended learning or in-school learning. Where are you going to get the bodies to do that? If you're on a freeze from hiring, if the governor is not allowing us to have any money to hire new teachers, and it's not enough time to get teachers fingerprinted um, and given the right tools to work. So I, I'm just trying to figure out how is this plan working? And with a delay for one week, what are you going to do in seven days that you haven't done in six months? That's my concern. 
Uh, so we are taking our leadership from our mayor uh, and our mayor says, you know, has given and he's been working with the unions to get us to this place of September 21st and we are having faith in his leadership and the promise that there will be resources to support reopening. And so we are taking it day by day. I know our principal, Principal Norman just mentioned how hard she's working to get that together that, you know, there are some sort of ideal policy prescriptions that we put out there and, and principals are, are struggling and grappling with how do we incorporate this? Will this work for my, my school community? Will this not work for my school community? If this doesn't work, how do I deliver on a really equitable quality education for my children when they come in? That's the work that's happening. Our principals are doing that work. Our superintendent's offices are doing that work. We in Central are doing that work all with the plan of September 21st, because that's the date that, that folks have set as a benchmark for us to meet. And so we're gonna work really hard to meet that. You're lifting up some really important issues. We have to look at staffing, that we have to look at our air ventilation quality testing and the upgrades that are required for our, our systems. We have to look at all of these things as we approach that date. And there are staff members who are working around the clock, working in our 1600 schools to get us to that place. Um, and so that's that's sort of how I'm focused and I'm oriented and I think all of us in DOE are oriented to like, these are the marching order, orders, we're gonna get it done, we're gonna work as hard as we can to tick off those boxes and get those those boxes checked. Um, and and that's, that's what we're doing and that's the work and that's the work ahead. But you're right to ask those questions, those are questions that folks will continue to, to ask as we move along. How far are we towards meeting all of our, are we at 100%, are we at 80%, where are we as we move along? Those are the right questions to ask and I, I believe that as we get closer to the 21st, we're going to get closer and closer to compliance because folks are staffed and working on those things. And then there was a question about returning to work um, and the Learning to Bridges program. And that is a program that is managed by the city through DYCD. We're really happy for that partnership. And the plan there is for these, these community partners, these community-based organizations to be able to provide childcare for families that have opted into blended learning um, in the fall. And so we are grateful for that partnership. We're, looking, we're working sort of arm in arm with DYCD, but obviously those programs are being managed and that entire program is, is managed by our sister agency. Uh, so we're excited that they're gonna be providing that support to our families. We think it's incredibly important, especially as we are uh, seeing parents move back into the workspaces. Um, and, and so, you know, would love to be answer, able to answer uh, questions more completely than that, but, but that's where we are. Uh, what I can tell you is that there's a survey online. And so for families, parents, who, caregivers who need um, need childcare during those off days where their children aren't in schools, please go to our website, schools.nyc.gov. That survey is available and families can sign up for the childcare. The issue was raised um, a moment ago uh, by Pam about funding uh, and, and, and about the, the governor's responsibility and, and funding whether, you know, from the state level down to the city. You want to address that since you are the chair of, of education, please? Sure, I'll, I'll address it and um, I'll address it with question marks. Um, right now, um, the governor has instituted about, or they seem to be sending out 80% uh, of the monies uh, um, uh, to our school districts. Statewide, we're talking about $5 billion or so um, that we're down. Uh, we don't have this money. We are looking to Washington to send us money. Okay, realistically, do we get it? I don't know. Okay, maybe we do, maybe we don't. So if we don't get it, what do we do? Well, we have to look for alternative sources. What are those sources? Well, maybe we've been talking about a millionaire's tax for years, okay, can, that can generate some money. Can that be done? Possibly, but it will also need the support of the governor who has said we can't do a millionaire's tax. We're going to scare the millionaires away. I don't know, maybe he'll relent. But if we don't do that, we have to look for other alternative sources. And where are the revenues going to come from? Well, we can legalize marijuana, okay? That will bring in additional taxes. We can legalize sports betting. That could bring in um, additional taxes. But is there the will to for this to happen? And will the um, revenues that we um, um, will be generating, it won't come in time. Um, if we allow, as we did years ago in the budget, um, the establishment of casinos to come. 
Now there are more casinos that are gonna be coming in the year 2025, okay? Um, there are licensing fees for those casinos. If we move those casinos approval up a few years and the licensing fees um, from them can generate money, um, that will be pretty immediate. Um, sports betting would be pretty immediate. Um, um, but again, we need legislation for this to happen and the will um, there. So there are ways to get alternative um, funds, um, but very few uh, are on the table right now. And uh, we're going to see. We are in dire straits right now. And um, uh, I'm scared. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm annoyed. I'm frustrated, um, and I'm sure everybody in the city is uh, as well. They make up these plans, and we've got to find money so they can make these plans a reality. And uh, that's bottom line. One of the ongoing questions or concerns is um, the availability of technology. And you know, the, the members right, money matters. The Feds gave us a little bit in the last CARES Act, but you know, not enough uh, you know, to, to take us through um, what we know is going to be needed for the upcoming year. But we still have kind of gaps in technology. People worried about tablets, data plans, people in temporary housing who don't have access to any of those things on an ongoing measure. Maybe the Deputy, uh, Deputy Chancellor can talk a little bit about how um, you know, the city is, is filling those gaps. I know many of my constituents are concerned about that. I have my printing presses going right now to print out the money for this. Uh, um, Inez, you're absolutely right. This is, there's going to be a monetary cost in everything we do. Um, um, this is part of the equation, and this is what we, the frustrating part. We are going ahead here and, and putting stuff to make people as safe as possible um, in, in place, but it all costs money to do it. And as you so rightfully um, say, to keep the inspections uh, going, to make sure um, 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 what we've done is stays healthy and stays working correctly. Um, um, it's all gonna come down to money. And um, I don't have an answer for you. I've outlined to you different things that we can do. When this money comes in, how quickly it comes in, is another matter. But right now, we don't have this money, and we've got to find out um, um, a way to do it. And we've got to find out within the next couple months, because, uh, well, we've got to take care of our kids and take care of the safety of the people in our schools. Um, that's bottom line. We've got to find the money. And um, this, it's a state the responsibility to do it. Um, the city is also throwing out the idea of um, borrowing some of these, this money. Um, that is something that's going to be a, a political football. There's a lot of people who doesn't, don't want layoffs to take place. They don't want the schools to be begging for money and therefore we should borrow. At the same time, um, there are people who say that, well, if we're going to borrow, um, who's going to pay for this? Um, our children will be paying for it in the future. Um, I don't know uh, what's going to happen in this way because borrowing can't happen without Albany approving it. And there's a lot of people in Albany who distrust giving borrowing power to the city. Um, but it is another way to go, and that would be immediate funds coming into the city. Um, so we can look in that direction as well. Well, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, and Adrian, before, because uh, uh, Pam, would you weigh in on this about the additional cuts that are proposed to the budget, Pamela? So during the PEP meeting, um, the chancellor reiterated, and I, I, I'm, I appreciate the fact that he finally admitted that um, it's all about the funding, right? I, I, as a parent, I knew that because the governor mentioned that at the very beginning. But what is concerning is the fact that there is a potential $20 million um, additional budget cut. And um, 
if Adrian can weigh in on that, um, it would be very helpful. But I know it has a lot to do with the fact that if we do not reopen, if I'm correct, there's a potential additional $20 million that would be cut from the budget. Yes, yeah, so I want to be clear just to, to sort of separate two ideas, right? There's reopening in blended learning as we are doing. Different jurisdictions across the state are looking at this differently. Some jurisdictions are opening to remote only. Um, and so, you know, reopening can look at, at, in a number of different ways. And yes, we must reopen. Yes, we must educate our children. I don't think we can abdicate our responsibility to educate our kids. I don't think we want to say um, that, you know, the cornerstone of this democracy, which is public education, is no longer important and we're going to, you know, set it aside. Uh, I think we continue to invest in our education because that's, those are our young people. That is our future. And so, Nowhere in any conversation that I've been a part of in the Department of Education have we talked about, you know, stopping the work, meaning stopping the work of educating our children. I think, you know, we are planning to open to blended learning on the 21st. Um, we are planning to prior to the 21st, I think on the 16th to begin with remote only. So that will be when instruction actually begins and starts um, officially counting, I guess, from the perspective of the state towards our 180 day timeline. Um, but I want to sort of clarify that, like, no matter what, we're going to continue to educate our children and we're going to start the school year. Uh, and that's not, a, that's not a question. And that's what the funding is connected to is when do we start the school year? When do we begin the process of educating our young people? That's going to start. It's going to start September 16th. The blended learning will begin following that on the 21st. If that answers that question. And then how do I feel about the cut? We absolutely should not cut public education. It's the one area where we shouldn't cut. It's the investment in the future of our society. It's the last place we should be looking to cut. Um, we are underfunded as it is, considering the fact that we serve 1.1 million children in the city of New York. And so, no, we shouldn't cut there. And the city has a lot of priorities. And I know the assembly members are hearing from our business, you know, pri the business priorities, our small business owners. They're hearing from, I'm sure, our sister agencies and, and other folks who are advocating for, um, you know, the value of their work. And there's a lot of valuable interests in New York City and across the state. But I would say that the number one interest for all of us uh, is public education. And so the investment should continue there and that the cuts, you know, the, the cuts will be hard felt anywhere, um, but but at public education should be the last on the list. Well, thank you. Robin, would you, you know, we, we heard what, what that, that the Deputy Chancellor indicated that, that cuts should not be done, but at the same time, we, we understand that blended learning uh, and the, the different ways that we're talking about going opening the schools is going to require additional staffing, and 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 they're talking about cuts. Pam brought up about the twenty million. Um, my chair brought up about uh, additional cuts that could be coming if we don't get anything from the federal government, any additional funds. So, Robert, would you kind of weigh in on this because I'm concerned because many children still don't have laptops. They don't have the materials needed within the home uh, and many children also uh, in, in depending upon where you live your building not, may not be wired for wi-fi so you know robin would you kind of weigh in on this because i'm very concerned about this so one thing that we've been doing on a district level from the summertime is certainly assessing the needs of our schools and our districts whenever our principals informed us that there was a technology shortage or um, anything, any type of shortages that they had, we had to, you know, escalate the issue to make sure that all of our students had devices. We worked one-on-one -on -one with each and every one of our principals to make sure that every one of our students had devices. Mm -hmm. And I want to say it was really successful um, during remote learning. It, it was very slow initially um, when we started in March, but it began to become more successful as we fully engage in remote learning. And so whenever there was any other additional gaps, we would be there to fulfill, even if we had schools borrow from each other, we wanted to make sure that all of our students had devices. Um, and we also are, have started that process now. Um, early this summer, we started to engage our principals to let us know about any potential gaps that they have in technology so that our students won't face any deficits coming in when school starts on this year. And so they've been sharing that information with us. We've been um, sharing resources with them. We've been escalating the issues to departments in which can help and provide those materials to our principals. 
And um, we've just been really one-on-one -on -one making sure that come school start that, you know, hit the ground running, they will be prepared and our students will be prepared. We're doing everything in our power to make sure that we do that for our, our children in District 5. Um, I also wanted to talk about the staffing gaps. So that is something that is happening across the city. Um, and it is an issue in District 5. We do have teachers that are out on accommodations uh, for health, health and safety reasons. But we, the DOE re recently issued a survey to schools indicating to uh, share the gaps that they have. And so um, we're hoping and we're very hopeful that out of that, those staffing gaps will be filled um, through the survey. So um, we'll work with our, but even prior to the survey coming out, we ourselves as a, as a district, you know, in their plans told our principals, okay, if tell us what are your gaps and if the gaps are staffing gaps let's figure out a second way let's figure out a third way and there are some schools that honestly cannot operate even in thinking about a first way a second way and a third way because there are some critical staffing gaps um so we're hoping um we we received guidance recently about a deployment plan um and that deployment plan is supposed to deploy staff from central offices um from other offices to schools, so we're, we're, we're waiting on further guidance around that. I don't have full information about that, but I know there is a redeployment plan that is currently in process, and hopefully that'll be helpful to close some of our school gaps, but we're um, continuously working with our schools to you know troubleshoot and be thought partners with them around the issues. Um, myself and Donica and I know Pam and Sanaya both know that, you know, we all, all the CEC, they have been so detrimental in helping us make these decisions, um, all of our return to school decisions for our families and for our students. And so it doesn't stop today, um, but as soon as I get off, we have to continue to troubleshoot with our principals and help them to make those really difficult decisions. First, how will New York City schools work to establish equity in a remote environment? Yep, uh, chiming in here now. So I can tell you that between March and June, we distributed over 300,000 iPads that were internet connected through T-Mobile to families. We prioritized our students in temporary housing, our families in temporary housing. So those were the first batches of electronic de devices that went out um, to make sure that we were supporting our students who needed that. And then thereafter, every electronic device was prioritized to families who did not have a device or did not have internet connectivity. So that's I one of the ways- I we in for that. That may be true, but many parents are not tech savvy, and and the the system at first didn't even work well um, because we weren't acclimated to it, and so that it was very difficult. I'm very concerned about remote learning. I'm very concerned about how my students are going to fare in 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 doing remote learning. So I, I you know I, I just want you to understand that. Let me give you a second question: How can public schools work to ensure? that their constituents still have confidence in public schools' ability to provide great education to their children. I would say I have full confidence in our teaching staff. I mean, it's our teachers that make the, the curriculum come alive. It is our teachers that go in and make a difference in the life of a child and the lives of hundreds and thousands of children over the years. And so our teachers are doing that work. They're gonna to continue to do that work. Part of the difference in terms of what families can expect to experience is that teachers will have a real investment in the beginning of this school year in the professional development around remote learning so that, that the way that they're delivering remote learning feels different. One of the complaints we had from families was that there weren't clear standards just in terms of the amount of live instruction that students were receiving. This year there will be live instruction every single day in remote learning. So teachers will be using these virtual platforms like this one, like Zoom, uh, Microsoft Teams, other platforms to be able to do live instruction with students. But it all comes with everyone trying to step up and adjust to this new format. And it's not that, every, obviously, optimally, we'd like to be back in school buildings. We'd like the pand pandemic to go away uh, and, you know, and go back to our traditional schools. It's just not possible. And so we have to cope and adjust to our circumstances. And that's what this is. Well, I want to join with Dr. De 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 Beckles about what training, and I'd asked this before, but I wasn't quite sure, what training uh, will be given, what aid will be given to the parents so that they can um, really participate in remote learning. And the last question is, did they fix the glitches? Did you fix the glitches 
and learn because there was there was there was an awful lot of glitches. I learned. Those are those are great questions. First, I wanna I wanna clarify. I'm the deputy chancellor of communications. I do a lot of parent engagement. I do not. I do not have a background in IT, so I am not fixing any glitches. Um, but our, I have full faith in our DIIT who have been working across the summer to fix the glitches. Not only have they been working to fix, fix the glitches, but all of those 300 plus thousand iPads now have hotspots in them, which means that families that have them can connect other up to five other devices onto that one uh, internet enabled iPad. So five other devices can be going on in the homes. And that's a big deal for families that don't have internet connection. I mean, my concern is that, you know, I think we have good intentions and I, you know, we, we want to say that we do have to educate our kids in some way. I have three children who are learning, um, have learning variations. I don't consider it a disability and remote was horrible for them. And so um, just thinking about my pre-K three kids and four kids, when you send those, those iPads out, there's no programs for parents to work with children on them. They had Teams, Google. So the parents that we send out to get them, they brought them all back to the school because they couldn't use them. So I'm just saying that if we're gonna do remote, right? Because remote has to be a part of this blended experience. DOE has to do a better job of giving quality apps and things that are gonna help parents. Because I'm an educated parent and I struggled doing remote. I think parents who have less skills than I have to have an iPad and there's no apps that can support, whether it's ABCs or coloring or things that they can do with their three or four year old or places they can go when they're not synchronized learning to work with kids, right? That's gonna make the difference in the learning. And so I think our intentions may be good in theory, but in practice, the reality is that we can't support this. Robin brought up a big point. Yeah, there is an issue in terms of human capital actually being able to execute in school learning. DOE is working on the issue, but we're less than two weeks away. This wasn't an issue two weeks ago. This was an issue three months ago. So if you didn't find an answer then, we realized that remote might be our only option. And, and I'm not gonna even talk about the equity issue. When we look at our more wealthier public schools, they're all going remote, even in my own district, right? So the schools that are gonna have the issue are schools like Pamela said in our district where we don't have a lucrative PTA with a, a six million dollar budget right. to help schools meet those gaps. And so I know that DOE is doing the best they can. And Adrian, I appreciate you, and you're always here to give good advice. I appreciate Robin, but you know I'm always that parent who's going to push the envelope and who's going to say, let's tell the truth about what we're struggling with because until we can tell the truth about what we're dealing with, we can't change it. And so when you have schools in my district principals calling me saying, I have 38% of my staff who's out on accommodations. Even if I want to do blending, I don't know how I'm going to get it. That's unfair to have those principals sit up late at night trying to figure out something that a central office gets six figures salary to do. I want to thank all of you. We, this is all the time we have left. I want to thank all of you for joining us and all the parents and, and families that came on to this live stream. I want to thank my guests today, uh, Assembly Member the Chair Benedetto and, and Rodriguez, uh, Deputy Chancellor, of course, Adrian Austin, Dr. Beckles, uh, Pam Stewart, my, my friend, um, Deputy Superintendent Davidson, and Principal Norman. On behalf of all the residents of, of my district and of New York City, we greatly appreciate your time, your insight, your education. This has been a very, very, very difficult year, and we understand that. Thank you for watching Represent NYC on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. This is Inez Dickens saying, stay, stay safe, wear masks, practice social distancing. Thank you. Mm -hmm.